Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the business school. My name is Ian Clark, and I'm the dean of the school. Uh, very big welcome to you for this event. I'm not going to drone on for long, just do a, a few uh, intros. Um, it's good to see so many people here. I had a meeting in Newtown earlier this afternoon. I couldn't believe how long it took me to get back up here. Couldn't find a taxi. I was slipping all over the place on the roads. Uh, that's the prize of uh, having the graduations and Holyrood Week all on the same day, and of it's course, an event like this. Um, anyway, a warm welcome from me to uh, for the fourth event with the Asia Scotland Institute. I'm sure others have been before to uh, some two of the talks were by Jared Leons, Global Chief Economist of Standard Chartered Group, and Stephen King uh, from HSBC. Um, we've got a couple of events uh, coming up. Uh, und, under the, the Asia Scotland Institute banner with Lord Desai uh, in the autumn and I think in January Dominic Barton from who's the global head of uh, McKinsey. Are there any seats down here do you want to can you put your hands up if there's any seats just for some people at the back so they can there's a couple down here and there's one on a row there so feel free to come through um so I'm delighted uh, to, to partner with uh, Scottish Financial Enterprise for, for sponsoring and supporting tonight's event. Um, is Owen here? I haven't seen him. Owen Kelly? No doubt he'll, he'll join us uh, later and, and other uh, Scottish Financial Enterprise members. This is just the sort of event we like to put on in, in the business school. Um, highly relevant business topic uh, by a preeminent uh, practitioner, which, which Jim is. Um, to a mixed practitioner or academic audience, and we've got quite a lot of, of our own um, master students, particularly here tonight. Um, for those of you, this is the advert bit, not familiar with the business school, I won't drone on. Uh, just two or three things. One, quite interesting that uh, 1918, essentially around the Bachelor of, Bachelor of Commerce, is when the business school uh, started. So uh, we're coming up in a few years' time for quite an auspicious point from our point of view. Um, we started the MBA here in, in, the ni in 1980, so that's 30-odd years old. We've now got around a dozen uh, master's programmes uh, and, uh, and about 1,500 to, to 2,000 um, students. And, of course, many of you will be familiar with the building, and we moved in here two or three years ago. Very international school in all sorts of ways, not least of which in the mix-up of students, 50% of our undergraduates, 90% plus of our postgraduates, even 50% of our faculty um, are international. And, um, and this event uh, with Jim speaking, Jim O'Neill speaking, is, is, is one of around 80 events that we, we put on uh, each year. Um, but we, we like to obviously interact with business in a, in a number of ways, and this is the sales bit. So, so particularly through student projects, consultancy projects, uh, and if you want to know more about how to engage with us, uh, just contact uh, Aidan Hetherington, uh, who will be around after the, after the talk. Um, so I hope you enjoy the discussion tonight, and I trust that you'll join us for uh, the drinks, short drinks reception afterwards. So welcome. Uh, thank you for coming on a, on a wet, miserable uh, day. Um, and I'd now like to hand over to... Gurjit Lali of the Asia Scotland Institute to introduce the speaker, Jim O'Neill. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about Asia Scotland Institute and the agenda for today. So uh, my name is Gurjit, I'm, I'm from the Institute. And then we have Jim O'Neill, uh, who will be speaking next. And J Bill Jameson, who will be doing the question and session. And then Roddy Gow, who will do the conclusion. A little bit about the Asia Scotland Institute. We're here to promote awareness and understanding and what will hopefully lead to collaborations between Scotland and Asia. And we do this by running three types of programs. One, economics and business. The second, culture and arts. And the third, education. Um, so this is our economic series called the Adam Smith series. And we've had uh, quite a few prominent speakers so far that were mentioned earlier on, so I won't go through them again. Um, and today we're very fortunate to have Jim O'Neill, um, who is the creator of BRICS acronym, and he's also a very best-selling author. Um, he wrote the, the Growth Map, and he was a former non-executive director of Manchester United football team. 
Um, so on that note, <laughs> I'd like to welcome Jim. Thank you. Maybe I'll wander around. Good, thank you very much. Ian, thank you. Can you hear me clearly at the back? Um, it is a, a great honour to be here, and I'm slightly overwhelmed by the fact that there's uh, not a seat free. Well, actually, there is one there, I see. So. <laughs> that's for Roddy that's, that's for if Roddy actually turns up. Um, as uh, perhaps many of you know, um, about uh, eight weeks ago, I, I, I left the almighty world of finance and Goldman Sachs. So uh, you will be witnessing me in uh, one of my few uh, post-Goldman Life presentations, um, which amongst other things are going to involve some slides created in a different way than I've used before. Um, so you are guinea pigs and a bit of an experiment in that regard. Uh, so I apologize in advance. Uh, I, I think uh, assigned is about 35 minutes or so for my comments. So what I plan to do is show you some pictures uh, for about half an hour, or, or knowing how much I end up talking, probably for all of that time, but uh, leave sufficient time uh, for Q&A at the end. Uh, and I'm very mindful of the fact that I should try to uh, relate it as much as possible to current events and, of course, things that uh, relate to Bonnie Scotland, perhaps, uh, which will be a struggle because I'm no expert on Scotland whatsoever, <laughs> other than the fact I, I do enjoy the uh, occasional trip here. So I, I shall try to make some remarks about that, uh, if not as I go through towards the end. So without further ado, to make sure we can stay on time, uh, let me uh, start. Can you see this at the back? Yes? <laughs> I think there's some people here are just coming for a sleep at the back. You can see all these countries, can you, by name? No, I didn't think you could. So, even though I said the new slides, uh, and they are, um, they're being created by somebody other than myself, so I can blame them, but... What, what, what I am trying to frame my presentation in the context, uh, which will be uh, the sort of underlying message is, especially, if I, I, I'm looking around here, I, I'd broadly say half of you are my generation, the other half of you are younger. And one of my contentions as, as the brick world has gone on is that it is very, very difficult I think, for people of my generation to get just how much the world is moving because it's very different than the world in which we grew up in. Uh, and I think for younger people, partly because you haven't been tainted by the same uh, experiences that my generation have, uh, it's probably a little bit easier. Or at least I hope it is because it is a pretty different world, which has plenty of challenges, uh, but in my view, way more opportunities than typically our generation currently says. So, and at the, at the core of the sort of thesis of mine, uh, and really the whole brick premise, is that ultimately economic growth is driven by just two things. Uh, the number of people that work in the country and uh, how productive they are. And it is as simple and as difficult as that. So if your country has a large population, particularly if it's one within the working age, so let's say between 18 and 60, or 65 in some countries, or if you're French, way less than 60, um, that, that's a good thing to be a big economy. And if they are productive people in particular, then you're going to be successful. So the first few pictures I'm going to show you are about size and wealth. So this is the top 20 populated countries in the world. Some of you at the front, I hope, can see it. Uh, I'm not sure if the colour combination of red and black quite kind of goes with that. I, I can just about see it from here. But 
my main uh, point <coughs> of showing it is in that 20 country list are the four BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India and China, uh, 10 of the so-called next 11, which those of you that are aware of, of some of the things I've uh, presided over since I dreamt up the BRIC acronym, is sim simply a phrase for the next 11 large populated countries after the four BRICs, excluding, importantly, South Korea, which I'll come back to talk about. Uh, and surprise, surprise, it includes the three largest uh, Western economies, the US, Japan and Germany. So one of the main reasons why they're in it and why they're the largest uh, economies is because they have a lot of people. And so the first issue a lot of people today have to think about when they focus on the challenge and the opportunity of the BRICS is quite simply, if you've got a lot of people, the real question is, why are you not big already? And so when people look at China and India in particular going forward as the two only billion plus populated countries in the world, in many ways the issue is why, why have they not stayed big? Because those of you that have studied history will know a few centuries ago they were. Ah, this is probably a little bit more easy to see. At the back, can you see these countries? Yes. yes. Somebody there can, only one person can. Um, so linked to what I just showed you here, this now shows you the top uh, 20 economies in terms of the size of their GDP in dollars. 15 of those are of the previous 20. Uh, I think confirming largely what I'd already said. Uh, in some ways, if one thinks of miracle economies in this sort of simplistic sense, they would be Canada, Australia, Spain. Most people wouldn't think that these days, of course. Uh, Switzerland, oh sorry, 14 of them. Switzerland, the Netherlands and Saudi Arabia. Those six are nowhere near the top 20 populated economies. I suppose Spain's one of the closer ones, uh, but they're in the top 20 in terms of size. Uh, which is interesting uh, to think about. As an aside, uh, when I was, I, I was putting these numbers together actually for my final formal Goldman Sachs finishing presentation, and linked to what I just said, we decided to, you know, it was this big issue of, in terms of investing, being big, does that matter in terms of making money? <coughs> and so we tried to test whether, the, if you would have invested in those six countries as opposed to the other 14, would there have been some different pattern? And the answer was no. Um, so investing is different than uh, economic size. Here are the top 20 wealthiest economies in the world. Uh, a very important thing for people to think about uh, in smaller populated countries, many Western countries today, fearful of the BRICS, fearful of China in particular, because these big countries are going to come trampling all over us. And maybe I dare say it, uh, quite relevant, I suspect, in the, uh, what doesn't seem to me, complex discussion about Scotland's future with or without the UK. Uh, but wealth and size are not the same thing. And what this shows you is actually, in terms of the top 20 wealthiest nations today, uh, there's not many of those that are in the previous two. So being big doesn't mean being wealthy. Or a more or a different way, or what I think is a healthy way of thinking about it, other countries getting bigger will obviously help themselves probably to become wealthier, as long as their populations doesn't, don't rise too much, but it's probably going to help the rest of us get wealthier too. Or two other more specific ways of saying the same thing, in the context of people worrying about China trampling all over the world, you don't hear too many people from Luxembourg, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, worrying about the size of Germany, for example. And I think that's sort of how many people should probably 
uh, think a little bit about many aspects of China and India and so on. Second thing, which um, goes to the core of international economic theory, uh, is that international trade, even though there are huge individual winners and losers of the trade that go with it, here I admit, despite 30 odd years of being in finance, I still stick to a core economic premise. International trade is a win-win in aggregate for us all. So by helping and encouraging countries that have a lot of people to get bigger, is going to be good for everybody in the aggregate. Although within the process of change, there are clearly big losers and big uh, winners, which I shall come on to talk about in a few minutes. Um, actually, let me jump through that slide, because that's the decade past uh, to what this one is. What this chart shows you here, importantly, uh, is uh, what I have been assuming to be the change in the US dollar value contribution to global GDP this decade. Uh, and let me point out uh, a few really important points. Because I'm guessing again at the back you can't see this very clearly either. So the first thing is the growth eight uh, is a group which includes the four BRIC countries and four of the next 11 these days, some people call it MIST. Mexico, Indonesia, South Korea, and Turkey. In fact, if you search the internet, you will see people claiming that I created yet another acronym, MIST, but I didn't. This weird world of acronyms has become so vast that people now create acronyms for me and say I created them. <laughs> Those four of the next 11 countries, along with the four BRIC countries, are the eight so-called emerging economies in the world today that are at least 1% of global GDP. Uh, I believed a few years ago that to call any of those eight countries or any country that's that big as still an emerging economy is basically an insult. Quite how anybody calls South Korea an emerging economy, which I'll come back to specifically as I've already said, is really quite stupid. South Korea, if I just go back to uh, the wealth chart, I like how the, uh, you might not be able to see them, but I like the way they jump around. It's kind of, that's new for me. South Korea you don't see in this top 20 list, but it's 24. South Korea is the 24th wealthiest country in the world today. When I was coming into this world, it had the same wealth as most African countries. It is the only country in the world of 45 to 50 million people that has made that transition. It's nearly as wealthy as Spain or Italy, and we call it an emerging country. Pretty stupid. Never, any, any, have we got any people here from South Korea, by the way? I bet you guys don't really think you're an emerging economy, do you? Well, um, I don't know, in terms of technology and um um, this, um, how can I say, um, technological advancement. I think uh, Korea can be um, classified as a um, um, developed country, but in terms of a living standard or um, leisure, maybe we are still in the emerging market, I would say. I'm jumping forward now while you were answering me. So, I said at the start that growth is all about the number of people that work and their productivity. Uh, so far, I talked a little bit primarily about number of people. That's the sort of easier part. It's the productivity bit, which is tough, of course. This shows you something called a growth environment score, which my old colleagues at Goldman Sachs <coughs> uh, did, and I assume still do. I don't, eight weeks on, I have no idea what the <laughs> hell they're doing. Uh, they calculate something called a growth environment score, which is an index of 18 different variables that goes from 0 to 10 uh, that w we believed, and I assume they still believe, are, are important for sustainable growth and productivity. Uh, here is the first of my football analogies of the evening. 
10 is the Manchester United of GES scores. Zero is the Liverpool. <laughs> Anybody here from Liverpool? Oh, that's so nice to be in a room this big without anybody from Liverpool. So, what you see here is the growth environment scores for the four BRIC countries and the next 11. These 15 countries are nearly 70% of the world's population. South Korea has a growth environment score of more than seven. It is easily the best of those countries. When you correlate uh, investing performance with wealth, I said earlier there's not a lot of correlation between size. There is pretty good correlation between investing performance and wealth. My old guys do this for 180 countries around the world. I think there's 215 countries in the world at the last count. South Korea is the second highest scoring country in the world, after Singapore. So very important for this institute in terms of things to think about. I think South Korea has got a lot of relevance and example setting for certainly other aspiring countries in Asia, but frankly, other aspiring countries in all parts of the world, whether it be Africa or actually maybe even some parts of the developed world. Uh, this picture you would not be able to see even if you're sitting at the front, I suspect. That lists all the 18 different things with each of the individual scores. I won't bore you with the details. Six general categories. You touched on the one that South Korea is particularly good at. I show on this chart, if you could see it, the United States by way of comparison. South Korea is the best in terms of widespread application of technology of every one of these countries, including the United States, or all 180. You sort of see it a little bit of Samsung versus Apple, for example. Uh, it's also pretty good on education, at least in terms of basic education. Dare I say it, Dean? Something that we might actually mm -hmm. learn from a bit more in our country. Never mind, of course, uh, many others. And as I said earlier, uh, there's quite a lot of correlation we've found between, or oh, I keep saying we, they found, or we did when I was there, uh, between wealth uh, and these scores, and indeed between investing performance. And I think if I were a policymaker in another part of the emerging world, whether it be Asia or elsewhere, I'd get on a plane and go to Seoul and figure out what I could adapt and introduce into my society, because if they do, they're going to be able to get closer to their potential. Let me go back, if I may, to fill in a bit more of the issues about how this is changing the world. Uh, and then I'm going to talk specifically a bit more about the US and China, and then I'll finish. Um, I'm trying to think of ways of making reference to things to do with European Monetary Union and the UK, never mind Scotland, but with all the world doing better is kind of basically good for those places. But I will make some reference. What this uh, picture shows you, linked to what I've just talked about, is fast forward into 2050, how many other of these countries uh, could become 1% of global GDP. And that blue dotted line down the middle is the cutoff point. So if you think the world is a confusing place already, and this is so topical in view of things going on, especially in the Middle East, but you would get, and we are probably going to get, if not all of these, quite a few other countries that are going to become as big as them in terms of their share of GDP. China becomes ginormous, over 20%, and I'm going to come back to China in a second. India, because it's got the most staggering demographics of any large country in the planet. I was just there three weeks ago for a day and had some very interesting discussions about all of that. Will become about the same size as the US. But of more interest in terms of forward-looking thing, you get the following intriguing countries too. From Asia, 
Indonesia, Pakistan, the Philippines. Look at this side because I can see it clearly. And just outside of that, Malaysia and Thailand. So for the, this institute, a lot of things to think about in terms of potential. And then linked to what I just talked, to, talked about in terms of the remarkable fun and games going on in the Middle East, uh, both Egypt and Iran uh, have the potential to become that big if they can do things to sort out their productivity. So that's the kind of future uh, that you younger people have to be all excited about and challenged by. And it's just for those old, wizened people to worry about. Let me now home in about the, the, the issues related to the scale that, of change that's going on in terms of trade. Uh, this is probably even harder uh, as presented for you to see. Uh, and what, what this shows you, and here I will be able to bring in something about European Monetary Union, what this tries to show you is the top ten, sorry, the top three <coughs> export markets for different developed countries. Start of the millennium in 2000, importantly when EMU started. 2012, and what it would look like at the end of 2020 if we carry on the same trend that we have been on or because some people think it's implausible that we carry on at the same trend, what would happen if the trend is just half what it's been the past decade? And the most striking thing about that is if you, t and I've done it for the US, the UK, Germany and Japan, the most striking one of the lot to me is Germany. If this is presented correctly, yeah. It's been presented in a, as I, I go back to my apology at the start, I've just seen this close up for the first time. It's presented, the columns and rows are presented in slightly different places. Here's, here's the following really important fact. By 2020, if we carry on at the same trend, Germany will be exporting twice as much to China as it does to France. I love to tease my friends in European policy making that if you ask most Germans by 2020 would they rather be in a monetary union with France or China, the answer is not France. And if there were any economic crisis, well let me say two things. First of all, if there were any economic criteria as to why EMU should have existed in the first place, it's in the process of being blown. Optimal economic unions are justifiable on the basis that the countries that are in it do most of their trade with each other, and that is not what is happening. The second thing to say, which is the reverse of that, I find my mind wondering whether actually the real reason why EMU has got problems is because that is the way the world is moving and not because of the other specific things that we all read and talk about all day long. Because the optimality of it is no longer what it might have seen. And if you would have spoke to most uh, believers uh, of EMU back before uh, EMU started in 99, they wouldn't have even thought that a world could have existed where Germany's top trading partner wasn't France. But that is where we are currently headed. Uh, and importantly, in terms of, and this is now turning to the UK and Scotland, in a world, and I'm going to come on to talk a few minutes more specifically about China, because it's so important. In a world where China's becoming more and more important, if you want to do well, you've got to give them something, not give them, sell them, help them, to do something what they want. You won't get there by telling them how to behave or what they want, which I believe is one of our problems here in the UK. And the same sort of pattern is true whether I showed you that chart, this chart, or any of those charts, uh, but I thought I'd home in on this one. 
uh, because this in some ways, and here you can see at least the lines, if not the words, and I'll now explain it, uh, a really uh, most vivid indication of the scale of change that's already going on. This is something that I found from a UN development report in February of this year. And I was shocked myself by this, and given how much time I have spent looking at these issues, if I'm shocked, most other people are going to be completely blown away. What that top line that is slowly coming down, then starts to accelerate down, shows you, is the percentage of global trade between what is called, in these circumstances, between North-North, or it's a sort of loose term for the Northern Hemisphere-based developing, or sorry, developed or rich countries. Amazingly, the bottom blue line, which is slowly heading up and has accelerated, is the trade, percentage of trade that goes on between so-called South-South, or another way of saying the largely Southern Hemisphere-based, not only, but others are included in it, so-called developing countries. And the reason why I say it's so striking is, as you can tell, we are not far off already where the amount of trade going on between these developing countries is nearly now as big as the trade going on between the developed countries. Just in the past three weeks, there has been a massive, massive deal done which has got hardly any attention in the Western media. And it's also relevant in the context of what is a big... I'm sure in my, in my old dealing rooms at Goldman Sachs, they are buzzing about this topic, as in everywhere else, about the supposed end of emerging market investing. <clears throat> at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, which is held every year, Midsummer's Day in St. Petersburg, surprise, surprise, uh, the Russian leader, Mr. Putin, announced a huge deal involving one of their energy companies, Rosneft, with one of China's biggest uh, energy companies, to the tune of $270 billion uh, over the next number of years, where Rosneft will be exclusively supplying them uh, with natural gas. According to some uh, sources of mine, most of that is going to be actually financed in ruble and RMB, not in US dollars. <coughs> And if that is true, that is the first sign I'm aware of a very large commercial deal involving a commodity which is not going to take place in US dollars. Translating that to very topical issues of the day with the Fed, when I was still working, nobody even, I'd never even heard of this word tapering. That was something you did with a uh, tobacco, I thought, and in a, what do you call it, a pipe. Um, but these days, it's something that scares the hell out of people in financial markets. But this notion that emerging markets are, again, vulnerable to the Fed tightening and the beginning of the end of easy bond market life is only true for countries that want to have their financial markets greatly linked to and dominated by U.S. markets. If we move to a world where trade is continuing to evolve with these countries, particularly the Asian ones, more and more dominant, and they do more things involving their currencies and therefore with it their markets, it will not be the case. And so there is a big difference between what is happening in terms of a short-term shock with the Fed saying it doesn't want to keep on adding so much liquidity and really how these countries will develop their own lives, uh, in my view, and indeed their own financial markets. Uh, let me jump forward for the remaining, uh, I think I've been talking about 25 minutes so far. I thought I'd spend uh, the last five minutes just talking uh, primarily about China and how it's interacting with the world and what is going on in China. Then I, I will say a couple of words before I do that also about India. Um, not least because I just went uh, three weeks ago for seven hours on a highly controversial trip, according to some people in the media that have found out about it, to visit uh, a gentleman called Mr. <coughs> Modi, who may be 
uh, the candidate for the BJP party in the next Indian election. And I was asked to present to uh, a, a room full of people uh, as large as this about the 10 things that India needs to do to reach its potential, uh, which links to a paper I wrote with a colleague in 2008 that kind of goes to this. If you could see this, uh, you would see that Russia is not fundamentally the weakest of the four BRICs, it's actually India. India is great potentially because it's got this ridiculous demographic potential. Uh, on some of the work we have done, uh, we did do, should I say, and it still holds true, by 2030, India's working population could be as big as that of the US and China put together. Between now and then, the increase in China's working population could be as big as the combined working population of the UK, Germany, France and Britain. Can you imagine that? So if they can do things to improve their productivity, the next 25 years, India, in terms of change, is going to be a much bigger story than China. But that's if. So in order to get any chance of getting there, they've got to do things to boost their growth environment scores, which are the second lowest of the combined 15 brick, sorry, the third lowest of the combined brick uh, and next 11 countries. The wacky world of India. China. I'm starting with this picture, uh, which is the US, not China. Uh, and I'm going into it by wanting to suggest to you, if, if you stand away from the past uh, five years, uh, or think about the world pre-2008 and post-2008, 2008 being the global credit crisis, one way of thinking about it all is that America used to save close to nothing, borrowed money from the rest of the world to finance its excessive consumption rates. China did the opposite. It saved a ridiculous amount of money, not consuming much of it at home, and sort of played its role in this sort of weird party with the United States. And 2008 happened because there was no one left in China or elsewhere to find some clever financial instrument to effectively to lend it to the United States and through the financial systems to its people to buy yet another house which was going to lose its value. That's sort of, in my opinion, the right way to think about why we had the mess. So looking forward, the way to get out of that mess is for China to be a bit more like the old US and the US to be a bit more like the old China. Or the US needs to consume less and produce more and China needs to produce quite a bit less and consume quite a bit more. One way of measuring that progress is to simply look at both countries' balance of payments. And for my according to some people in the media, apparently jaundiced view, I find it too easy to see that we are basically going in the right direction. Here is the US balance of payments. Uh, in, is it red or murky pink? Uh, is the US current account balance as a share of GDP. Before the crisis, it was nearly 7%. Today, it's about half. The yellow line kind of can ignore that. It's something called the broad basic balance, which in includes the current account. Current account is the biggest part, but it also includes FDI and cross-border portfolio flows. If I just flip back, surprise, surprise, red chart, just the red chart is US house prices compared to personal income. Alan Greenspan, amongst others, told us it was always impossible to identify a bubble in advance. <laughs> That's one of the easiest ones that I've ever seen. And despite all the criticisms my old colleagues at Goldman Sachs have got about everything in life, uh, 
the research guys I work with were on record in 2005 and saying US house prices would drop. Policymakers at the time said, don't listen to Goldman Sachs because they're just sensational. Look what's happened since. And the reason why we have a housing recovery going on in the US today is because the collapse has been so big, very different than Europe, unfortunately, looking forward. Their collapse has already been so big that house prices are back to levels of personal income in the US that existed at the start of the 1990s. So today, people in the States can afford to buy a house, whereas in the middle of this madness, when they were borrowing money like crazy from the rest of the world, particularly China, they couldn't. So let me go to the flip side of that and to lead into some comments about China. There's something there about Japan I could talk about in Q&A, because Japan's part of Asia, and there's a lot of interesting things going on there too. Here's China's balance of payments. Surprise, surprise, the opposite of what I've just showed you for the US. When we went into this mess, China had a current account surplus of over 10% of GDP. Today, it's less than three. Isn't that what we want? And so right now, when the media are talking about, oh my God, hard landing, China slowing, we should not, in the West, really care about China's GDP. What we should care about is what they are consuming. Because if they are consuming more relative to what they produce, this is going to continue to come down. And not only will it not really harm us if they grow by less, it might make life easier because there will be less pressure on commodity prices, meaning that real disposable incomes for people elsewhere, uh, as is possibly going on already now, are going to start going up. Here is a picture of Chinese retail sales relative to industrial production. Uh, it is a sort of crude uh, but monthly measure of watching the rate of change of consumer spending relative to production in China. If the line is going up, it means they're going in the right direction. And as you can see, it sort of erratically is going in the right direction. I don't, we have a laser pointer on here, we don't know. Yes, the, the top, Ooh. red dot. So, interestingly, uh, and linked to many of the considerable dilemmas that China is going through, uh, is this rather severe blip that happened here, which is probably a reflection of the attempts of the new leadership to clamp down on far too much illicit luxury gifting. And they kind of realize, well, if they're doing that at the same time as trying to uh, cap out house prices, then the shift to consumption isn't going to be quite so smooth as uh, others certainly would want uh, and they themselves ultimately need. Interestingly and rather encouragingly, there has been some recovery and you can see, even though we're off the highest levels, we are way above where we were uh, in the early days here, post-crisis. China, uh, I'm going to finish with this job because it's the most important. I haven't said any of this, and I normally start most presentations off by saying this. China grows by seven and a half this decade, which is what I've been assuming it will do. Decade to date, it's eight and a half. So China's slowdown is still stronger than those of us that have looked at it more closely than most. China grows by seven and a half percent this decade. That is equivalent today of the US growing by 4%. In my professional career, the US has never grown by 4% a decade. China today is bigger than half the size of the United States. It creates another Greece every three months. It creates another Cyprus every, in fact, in the, during the Cypriot crisis, by the time they reopened the banks, China created another one. To put it in the context of the rest of the BRIC world, not only China the same size as the other three BRICs put together, I only realized this about six weeks ago. China, since the end of 2010, has created another India. When I see people going through the ridiculous comparison of China versus India, the only thing that's similar is that they both have more than a billion people. Trying to compare India and China, second football analogy of the night, 
is a bit like comparing Manchester City and Manchester United. <laughs> it is very unfair to the Indians. Indi China has definitely slowed. Primarily because they wanted to slow it. China, I read last week, supposedly, as I sort of come out of my sort of half-fogged retirement occasionally, was going through a credit crisis, according to the media. How can a country that has a savings rate of more than 40% of GDP, where most of its financial system is still owned by the government, be experiencing a credit crisis? Chinese interbank market rates rose sharply, I'm guessing, is because the Chinese authorities wanted to send a very clear message to various participants in the so-called shadow banking system. Behave or you are finished. Surprise, surprise, Chinese interbank market rates are way back down, not far from where they started. This is a proprietary Goldman Sachs coincident and leading economic India indicator. Up means China's growing more, down means it's growing by less. China has been slowing for two and a half years. It is a reflection of the fact they deliberately stopped house prices growing like crazy. They are trying to indirectly take themselves out of cheap exports by allowing the RMB to keep rising and very importantly deliberately raising wages, no longer the cheap source to produce. Scotland can probably produce things, certainly food and drink-related stuff that China would probably now find it easier to buy. Education, probably the greatest attribute that the United Kingdom has to export, and this place here in Edinburgh, probably in a better position than most. I was at an event in Singapore just before I left, and over dinner, I heard a couple of Chinese people saying that because of the decline of the pound and the rise of the Australian dollar, they were trying to send their kids, and there were more of their friends wanting to send their kids to have an English education here in the UK. Amazing anecdote. So China has slowed, it might slow a bit further. So long as they consume more relative to what they produce, that's all you need to have to focus on. And at the core of Asia, that is the most important thing to think about in the next few years. And on that note, and I've talked for my full 35 minutes, I shall stop. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to do is go straight to uh, questions from the, um, from the hall, either on the, what we've seen on China, India, or you may wish to uh, draw out uh, Mr. O'Neill on what's been happening on the bond markets uh, and the implications of that uh, for the emerging market economies. So uh, who would like to fire off first uh, with a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, I know that your main message is the upbeat account you've given of China's role in the global economy, mm -hmm. but I was fascinated by your comments on Korea and Korea's outstanding performance. Mm -hmm. um, you looked at those indicators, such as um, PC usage, internet access, and so on, course it's very hard to know what is cause and what is effect yeah. and so could you just tell us very briefly why you think Korea has um, come up with the outstanding performance that it has of course if we go back into the history we see a lot of protection we yeah. see very high industries such as Samsung's and LG's that are now performing yeah. very well um, in the past were anything but open there was a lot of protection so what is your account of the Korean success. Can you, can you, could everybody hear at the back? So, is my mic still on, yeah? Um, in stereo. Um, uh, let me give you three, three parts uh, of, of answering that, also with a bit of recent anecdotal colour. Um, I think it, that these, these 18 indicators we use here are all Effect, or the six buckets are sort of weighed equally. Um, my, my, my guess is the thing that's most important is education. Um, and it, 
in my post Goldman life, uh, at, at some point, I have to say I'm enjoying my eight weeks so much that I, it may get delayed because I'm enjoying the occasional moments of sunshine, being out in the fresh air especially. But um, at some point, one of my goals is to try and come up with a more sophisticated version of this. Uh, because we, we didn't test it, the, the weights, with individual econometric evidence. But, um, and again here, I'm probably sufficient of an economist to have a, a, an, a bias that I will have to test. But I suspect that the common factor that's so key for so many of these things is education. Um, and I think that is really, really important. You can see in, through, through some of the other variables where a better educated population is going to make it easier to do many of these things better. Uh, I say that because the bucket which superficially is, the, and the second point, uh, is the toughest is to do with governance. And one of the things I, I really liked hearing from the very controversial Mr. Modi when I met him, uh, and I don't know how well people here will know anything about this guy or follow him, but he, he's the chief minister of the very successful state of Gujarat, which is unlike uh, the national economy of India has continued to grow by 10%. He has a very catchy slogan, which he calls uh, M2 squared, which is uh, minimum government, maximum governance. And if you look at this top bucket, it's all about uh, a degree of co uh, political stability, amount of corruption, and the legal system. And those three are, are so hard for particularly young emerging nations to change. But I think the more educated your people become, the more likely that they will have to change it. And I find myself, if I, I translate some of this right now, Turkey and Brazil, as, as worrying as some aspects of these protests are, a large part of me, having been immersed in this world for the past 12 years, thinks, well, these are two countries that have had a huge amount of success and a lot more people done well, and they like it, and they want more. And they want their governments to govern and not be obsessed about size and, and their favorite pet projects, never mind the amount of squandering and wastage. Uh, and so that would be the, the, the second thing I would say. And then thirdly, uh, the the colourful part, which goes to an angle of your question, which is so important. How did, how did South Korea do it? I, I was at a really interesting breakfast with a, a group of important African political figures in London about six weeks ago. And I, I was asked to start it off, and I gave them this thing about South Korea. And one of them, uh, with some, some diplomacy, it, the diplomacy sort of tapered off pretty quickly, essentially put it out to me, it's okay for you fancy dons from the West to point all this stuff out, but at the same time, you're trying to force uh, a system of, of democracy on us, which South Korea didn't have at the start. So South Korea did this probably because it had a state-dominated society. And I think it's a, it's a very important basic observation. Uh, as another parallel, earlier this year, uh, I found myself in Latin America, and, and particularly on a, uh, it was primarily a holiday in Chile. And I had a very interesting conversation with the American ambassador at his residence, uh, like you do. Uh, <laughs> and we had a, a couple of those most wonderful, um, whisk, what do you call the Chile, Chilean cocktail? Uh, the Pisco sour. Pisco sour, Pisco sour. How could I forget Pisco sour? <laughs> Uh, and he was marvelling about how strong Chile is and actually very unflattering about Brazil. And he talks a lot about how Chile is the real example in Latin America. And he pointed out that Chile could, controversially in many people's eyes, that Chile couldn't have done it without Pinochet. And so having strong governments, whether it's democratic or not, I think is important, which takes me full circle back to India and this never-ending comparison that so many people love to have about India versus China. Over the past 20 years, is it a coincidence that China's done better because it has got a strong government 
and India has struggled because it doesn't. I, I certainly think South Korea's had its success because it's had strong government or strong decision making. And I guess if there's an underlying thing, I think this, this notion of governance as opposed to government, I think is important in terms of economic progress. Thank you. Yes, gentlemen, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, two, two points, really, that I wanted to make. Um, one is you mentioned population as sort of a crucial point for, for development. So if a country has a lot of people, there's potential for growth. Um, but do you also see limits there in terms of overpopulation or even social unrest? So if you, if you look at the BRIC countries and even, for instance, Turkey, um, they all have problems with social unrest at the moment. You have um, in Brazil, you have some sort of social movement at the moment. You have it in Turkey. You have it in some parts of China as well. So to what extent do you think um, these kind of problems of overpopulation and you know, sort of social um, upheaval could hamper some of the growth in these countries? And secondly, um, you mentioned this, uh, you had this graph with the wealthiest countries, um, so GDP per capita, really. Yeah. Um, and what struck me about it was um, most of them were actually countries with a lot of natural resources. So you had Qatar up there, you had uh, Norway, the UAE, um, Australia. So um, just because they're at this point exploiting a lot of their natural resources, uh, is that really a, a good indicator of how wealthy they are and how sustainable they are? So would that be the same picture in, in, in 30 years? Or would they not just sort of exp exploit their resources? So it's basically yeah, about yeah. natural okay. capital degradation. L and let me animals. answer the second question first, because uh, I don't think all those countries you just said are the wealthiest. Um, Qatar is obviously right up there. Um, but uh, on the contrary, if you look at the 18 variables within something like a growth environment score, ability to produce commodities is not in it. Uh, another reason why South Korea is a very important example, South Korea does not have any real natural commodities. And it is usually the case that most commodity producing countries, especially ones with large populations, are not very successful because the famous Dutch disease. Uh, which arg arguably is one of Brazil's biggest problems right now, because it, it makes them lazy. Uh, I, I would argue Norway and maybe Canada are the only really two examples of countries that have become generally successful, even though they're commodity producers. So I, I don't think, I, 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 I would say almost being a commodity producer is a bit of a curse. Uh, on your uh, first question, which I know, what was it again? Oh, so, oh, so yeah, I'd, I, I'd like to start by saying or, or re-saying what I said. Uh, I didn't say having a large population was important to, to be successful. I said having a large population was a prerequisite to be big. <coughs> big and successful linked to the answer I just gave you are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, you, you can't be big unless you have a lot of people. Uh, on that list of wealthy countries, I hope, unless it's been fiddled around with since I last had direct control of them, should have been Luxembourg and Bermuda. But that, those, these are countries that are never going to be big because they don't have many people. And so uh, I, don't, and I, I go from that directly into the, the, the broader comments you said. Uh, I, don't, I don't think those countries that are having trouble are just because they have a lot of people or because you said they are overpopulated. Where, where is the evidence that a Brazil is overpopulated? For, you know, some, some parts of Brazil are the most underpopulated uh, places in the planet. Um, you could say the same about many, you know, they have huge land masses. And, and I, I, I would see it Obviously, there are very specific different examples in, in different places, but uh, I, I think because of, and here's another huge benefit of the powers of modern, modern technology, uh, aspiring people all over the world want, want more. 
and want things that others don't have. What, one, of the, one of the fascinating things about these protests in Egypt the past two days is there is this peculiar alignment uh, between seemingly people that uh, are more liberal and those that actually are quite like the old life. And the only common connection, surely, is they want something more. Uh, look at the uh, election in Iran, uh, which one might have thought, apologies to Iranians here, but I have some, have, do we have any Iranians here? No Iranians. Um, you know, some people, if not most people in the West, would have thought those results would have been rigged so much there would have been no chance of a moderate winning. But within an Iranian context, a moderate has won. Um, I don't think Turkey's protests are because it's overpopulated. Well, maybe to call it overpopulation is probably not the right. We've had plenty. Summer, summer of 2011, we had plenty of protests all over Britain. You know, these, we should be careful about broadly simplifying protests being the prerogative of, of these countries. <coughs> protests happen everywhere. Thank you. I'll take the gentleman here, and then after you, the gentleman at the back. Take you first. Thank you. This is um, slightly off the track of Asia, but going back to the comments you were making on govern strong governance, mm. remember 20, 25 years ago, there was a really good editorial in The Economist, uh, which was arguing that the reason that Margaret Thatcher had been so successful, if you accept that, was not that she had the right policies, particularly, but that she set on a, a group of policies and then stuck with them. And I think that you know, is possibly what you were saying, too, about the Chinese government compared with the Indian ones. Right. And I was just wondering, with the asset management hat on, um, you know, when I was young... Um, I don't wear that one anymore. <laughs> when I was young, companies produced an annual report annually. And now it's every, all the focus is on the quarterly, quarterly yeah. results yeah. and the... Uh, Fund managers criticise companies that don't that don't deliver to their expectations on a quarterly basis. Yet most of these businesses, like the countries, they've got to be long term. Yeah, surely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. And I wonder if, well, you know, what can oh, be I get you. Just that? we are we are we are completely off. There's no media reporting here, is there? <laughs> <laughs> I'll pause my pen. <laughs> <laughs> you know. About, uh, about, well, the, the, day I, the day my planned uh, retirement was announced, I wrote down on a little yellow sticky pad, uh, Anthony Bolton, who, in my judgment, uh, has been one of the best uh, investors uh, of my generation. And I wrote it down because Anthony was, already, was, was having difficulties uh, succeeding uh, in being as good an investor in just the two-year period he embarked on it in China than he had in his previous 30-odd years. He announced subsequently that he's calling it a day. Uh, and I did that primarily for a selfish reason because I knew I would have lots of people trying to persuade me that I should, in my new life, embark on some kind of weird fund management stroke hedge fund thing. And uh, I thought to myself, well, if Anthony Bolton can't do it, why, why, why can I? Uh, and I think part of the problem is that, uh, especially if you gear yourself up to a very high fee base, you've got to justify it. And, and, and with the world of telecommunications and media focus and everything, it, the pressures are, are, are ridiculous. And I, I, you know, as a as an observer and participant in financial markets in over 30 years, I think the only time you can really, really make good money is when valuations are ridiculous and people are scared. And the, the, world, the world of investing needs to adjust to something a bit more sensible than it, than it is today, in my opinion. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman at the back. <clears throat> okay, and a Sherman to School of Geosciences. School of Geosciences. Yeah. This sounds this sounds scary. 
No, it's, it was a very good talk and I found it very interesting, especially a part about Rosneaf and the deal which, between China and Russia. And I think energy consumption is a big thing. And to be fair to the, the person earlier who spoke about when you asked where is the evidence of population and effect on energy consumption, that doesn't have, have an effect. And in China, they did have a law which you could only in certain areas have one child per family was an indication that overpopulation does have an effect. So that's what, so where do you see the balance between energy consumption of overpopulated countries? There seems do you think it's China's There's a lot of different here? questions thrown in there. <laughs> okay, make it, I make it Let, one. Do I'll, you think I'll, answer, I'll answer the two which I think are the, the deeper ones, one of which goes back to this gentleman's question. Um, Again, I find myself so much of an economist that I, I don't believe this too many people in the world stuff. Um, where I did my, I did my PhD, yes, pe people were daft enough to give me a PhD a few decades ago. I, 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 I did it during the second oil price crisis. And it was very popular at the time, uh, and easier because oil prices were already doing that, it's very popular for people to claim that uh, the world was going to run out of oil uh, and similar sort of arguments to what people say today, even though BRICS didn't exist and nobody talks about China and nobody talks about India, uh, and that we were going to have enormous problems as a result of this clamour for resources. Then what followed was a 25-year period of declining oil prices uh, because one of the, I often say economics is a completely useless social science, and in many ways it is, and, and that people have to remember that it is a social science and not a science, which is why people get things so wrong so easily, because why should you not get things wrong? Because it's a social, you don't know. But one of the things economics is very good at describing and, or, or acknowledging is something called relative prices and the allocation of scarce resources. So when you go through periods where commodities appear to be under particularly intense demand relative to deliverable supply, prices rise sharply. What people forget about, which is about the only thing I learned, I learned three things in my PhD. One, don't do one in economics. <laughs> Two, forecasting foreign exchange is easier than oil prices. And three, slightly more seriously, the long-term elasticity of supply and demand for commodities is bigger than everybody thinks. And that's what we are witnessing again today. Shale oil is the perfect example of it. I think I saw an old pal of mine uh, get some attention in the media yesterday, a guy called John Llewellyn, saying that oil prices could halve from here because of shale oil. I think he's right. And I wasted three years on a PhD on the topic, and I have <laughs> no idea where oil prices are going. So I don't, I don't believe this stuff. It, it, scare, it scares us all, but in the process of scaring, it results in the changes that society needs. Um, we've got lots of hands going up, so I'm going to take two final but very short questions to finish off with. Uh, I'll take you, sir, first, and then you. Okay, but keep the <coughs> questions short. Thank you. No lane, no women, no women. <laughs> women not allowed. I didn't know. Is there any women? Is there any women that want to ask a question? There's a lady there. Can I? Yes, indeed. Yeah. I, I don't. Go first. Go first, uh, quickly. Yeah. Can, uh, can you describe uh, which countries in Africa you are more optimistic about and recent emergence of Burma, like changing from, uh, recent emergence of Burma from changing to dictator to more towards democracy, and which African country, like Central Africa, Tanzania, or Democratic Republic, are you optimistic about those countries? Oh, gosh. Uh, we should probably chat. Like, there's so much going on in Africa. I, I, I you, you cannot think of Africa as one, it's kind of ridiculous to do that. I mean, you can't, you know, East Africa, North Africa, South, and then even within them, they're different. Um, and by the way, I know nothing about Africa, despite having said that. Um, 
But there were so many different places that are exciting. But the, the, if there were the one that I'm most excited about is the is the biggest populated one, Nigeria. Nigeria is nearly 20% of the continent's population. And I, any people here from South Africa? Two of you. So, many South Africans, particularly in South Africa, get really annoyed at me for saying what I'm about to say. <laughs> but the idea that South Africa could be the continent's representative in BRICS is ridiculous. The Nigerians laugh at it. In fact, I don't know if this has happened while I've been busy doing things other than not staring at screens all day long, but in the, in the, in the revisions to Nigeria's GDP data that are due, we might find out that Nigeria is already as big as South Africa. Um, and if these guys continue down the path of trying to improve their governance with, with a country with their demographics, the potential is just incredible. It, it might not exist as one country in another 20 years, but if they can keep it together and lead it properly, Amazing. And in the context of this previous discussion, one of the few countries where their, where their finance ministry assumes that oil prices are going to be lower the following year. That is the right way to behave as a commodity producer. Thank you very much indeed. The lady question that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ling Liu from uh, Business School. And my question is, I think you talk about Asia and China, India, China, Korea, and Japan. And one, one important thing is that their export-driven policy, export-driven growth, if I may say that, and they, that makes them become the winner of this trade liberalization, which is thanks for the American, you know, United States uh, 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 pr uh, promotion. So my question is, all their success or growth are, to some extent, depends on Americans' uh, policy or respond. Uh, so I would like well, to see your America, view. America's success is because of us. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you will say two ways. Uh, I would like to see your view about, uh, you know, America now is trying to bring back their production and uh, exporting as well. So in your view, in the long term, uh, to what extent America could be able to <coughs> shape or, re or reverse this kind of China's exporting or the, 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 the trend of the emerging economy? Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't, well, I think China, ch there are similarities between China and Japan in the context of how I understood your question, but I don't think, I think you said India as well? I don't, Korea. I'm Korea, sorry, the three, but th it's true about those three, and, and some might regard the, the, those three as the most successful large Asian economies. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, in my judgment, if their, if their economic success is purely based on exports, it's not going to be permanent success. Um, as Japan has seen a lot of evidence of the past 20 years. Um, by the way, Japan's, uh, the, the share of trade in Japan's GDP is, is actually way less than many European countries. Uh, less than the EU as a whole, actually. Um, India's, another reason why India is so different and so interesting is, of course, uh, that they're, they're not so export-based and have already a very strong share of consumption in GDP. Um, but to come to the second part of your question, it's, it's, it's an exciting moment for the United States, uh, linked to what I said about shale gas, and for multiple years of a, of a dollar decline. Uh, I, I'm in the camp that believes the US is, 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 has got its competitiveness back in, in heavy industry, probably for the first time in my professional life. Uh, and that is a big challenge for producers in Asia. Um, some of it is seeing uh, in autos, for example, uh, big, big shifting of Japanese auto producers more and more to, to the Americas, Mexico, hu huge winner from all of this. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've run out of time, in fact it's slightly over time, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Neville Washington. Thank you. Um, first of all, my name is Neville Washington, not Roddy Gow, and Bill. <laughs> uh, so I'm a late sub, so apologies for that. Um, I'm, uh, I want to talk about two things. The first thing I want to talk ab about is to give some thanks to our wonderful speaker, and the second thing is to give you a plug for the Asia Scotland Institute. And 
So if I turn to much the most important uh, subject first, um, this is a self-evidently a full room, and I guess that there is a subtext about how we manage to fill this room is what sort of a guy is it that, that arrives at the top of the heap? And Goldman Sachs is quite a big heap. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, the sort of test question that he was being given to ask, uh, uh, answer was, how did I stack up as, a, as a, a credible incumbent of the chairman's job? And I think he did pretty well. Um, my sense is that trying to distill um, uh, ideas out of, uh, out of the deluge we were getting was like trying to take a sip from a water hydrant. <laughs> and uh, one of the very good tests of um, how a speaker has gone down is whether the audience has run out of appetite for asking questions at the end of, at the at the, end of the time, um, and self-evidently, he did not. So, well done. You passed my two tests. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Good. You're going to have to tell me how I get to the slides. Um, um, uh, I'm going to give you a... Uh, we, the the, the right-hand arrow. Thank you. Even I can do that. Um, First of all, I want to talk about uh, what the Age of Scotland Institute is for. Uh, the great thing about th this job is made very easy because in many ways, Jim has done precisely that. If um, Scotland is going to um, uh, get itself on a proper growth path, these are the economies that we're going to have to engage with. And the Age of Scotland Institute aims to do a small part of that by, first of all, creating a network of links, and secondly, equipping um, particularly young business leaders uh, with the skills uh, to do to do business uh, with the Asian uh, with the Asian economies. And this part, uh, this speak, this talk was one part of the program that um, uh, that we are running in order to try and give a, a, a flavour of what this is about. Um, and uh, we're pretty young. We only started last year, um, and I think that we've um, uh, uh, we've already heard mentioned at the beginning about uh, uh, some of the sp the speakers we've already had. Um, I hope that uh, uh, that this particular little pinnacle won't be um, overshadow what follows. But you can see that um, uh, we have got quite a hefty uh, list of speakers that uh, to follow. And if that's this year, then in 2014, uh, we get um, a couple of others. Um, Dominic Barton, I think I've heard of him. Vince Cable, I think uh, we've heard of him too. Um, so um, uh, I, I, this is a, a, we're about creating a platform that will allow you to engage. And I hope we will all see you again. Thank you very much indeed.